Investigators say the East Area Rapist has attacked several teenage girls. A 29-year-old wife was raped while her tied-up husband had to listen. It's so warm in Concord tonight that people have their doors and windows open, but the police are saying lock up tight. Every time the East Area Rapist strikes in the new city, the police switchboard lights up. And some leads develop, but a clear identification has not been made. It started with a serial rapist and grew into a manhunt for a murderer that spanned 500 miles. Hello, I'm Dan Ashley. Welcome to a special ABC7 presentation, Chasing the Golden State Killer. Joseph D'Angelo, the man police accused of 40 years of terror and torment, is now in jail, charged with 12 murders. The case, the stuff of Hollywood movies and real life nightmares. As the investigation unfolds, we comb the ABC7 archives and document decades of fear. For the Bay Area, it starts in the fall of 1978, when the community already had plenty of other reasons to be nervous and on edge. These are the first pictures out of Guyana on the incredible orgy of death that took place in the People's Temple Agricultural Mission at Jonestown. Disturbing news made local headlines in 1978. More than 900 followers of Reverend Jim Jones committed suicide by drinking cyanide-laced poison. Days later, two of San Francisco's most prominent politicians are assassinated. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. Also making news back then, Jerry Brown is re-elected in the fall to his second term as governor. He is said to be still dating singer Linda Ronstadt. The 49ers are in a massive losing streak, and the Raiders are playing their last season with John Madden as coach. But fall also brings a predator into the Bay Area. It's a new hunting ground for a serial criminal already terrorizing Sacramento. He came in, he had a ski mask on, and jumped on the bed and had a knife. And there was a man shining this flashlight in my eyes with a ski mask on, holding a large butcher knife. My husband was home, we went to bed, our bedroom door opens and all I see is a flashlight. They knew he had gl leather gloves on, I could hear him, I could feel them. He told us with clenched teeth, shut up or I'll kill you. He asked in a very harsh whisper like, do you wanna die? Do you want me to kill your mother? He untied my ankles, told me to follow him. I'm in a little teeny nighty and I walk down the hallway, and as I'm walking down the hallway, I'm saying, oh my God, I'm gonna be raped. The first attacks are on the east side of Sacramento County, so the suspect is dubbed the East Area Rapist. As the rapes continue, newspaper headlines describe a community in panic. In February 1978, Katie and Brian Majori are shot to death in Rancho Cordova near Sacramento while out on an evening walk with their dog. Clues at the scene lead authorities to believe these are the East Area Rapists' first murders. Over the next few months, the rapes continue in Sacramento County and the Central Valley. Then in October of 1978, the attacker moves into the Bay Area, striking twice in Concord. He raped a 29-year-old housewife near the Ignacio Valley Shopping Center at 5.30 this morning. Her husband was tied up nearby and had to listen. Her eight-year-old daughter was locked in the bathroom. We dug into our ABC7 News film archives for a look back at the crimes that became a Bay Area obsession. He robbed and ransacked the home, tearing panties, bed sheets, and pillowcases. We call him a rapist, which he certainly is. He's also a burglar. Concord police responded to 200 phone calls in the first few hours after the word got out about it. People reporting uh, prowler calls, uh, suspicious circumstances, some people even turning in their neighbors because they think that he's, he might be the rapist. Over the next 10 months, there are attacks in San Ramon, San Jose, Danville, Fremont, and Walnut Creek in quiet suburban neighborhoods where residents are used to feeling safe. The only thing we really know about the East Area Rapist is that he's a pro. He's been at this for four years now, and still, nobody even knows what he looks like. The crimes are carefully planned. Investigators believe the rapist is stalking specific victims, sometimes even entering their homes days before the actual attack. This lawn was wet, and that means he left a trail of footprints. It's really horrible as the kids know about them. I was up at the swim club, and they had a... Um, a sign saying, lock your homes as a prowler in the neighborhood. And a 10-year-old boy came up to me and said, oh, it's not a prowler, it's a rapist. Why don't they say rapist? 
Anxious residents buy guns and pack community meetings to learn how to protect themselves. Okay, the gentleman asked if the telephone wires were cut here in the incident in San Ramon, and it's uh, affirmative they were from the inside. It takes very little pressure to remove an entire window or even a sliding glass door. But despite all their locked doors and bolted windows, they are all still very much afraid tonight of the East Area Rapist, and that makes them all, in a sense, his victims. Adding to the terror, the rapist taunts his victims for years afterwards with phone calls. Thirteen-year-old Mary Burwart of Walnut Creek was one of the youngest rape victims. Police believe the rapist had watched Mary from a playhouse in her yard. After last night's attack, there's something new to worry about. Their children. The rapist always wears a mask so victims don't know what he looks like. But over time, investigators come up with various sketches. They're based on neighbors' descriptions of suspicious men spotted in the days leading up to the attacks. In July 1979, the mysterious man slips up during an assault on a Danville couple. That's the predator's last known attack in Northern California. The trail goes cold. But what no one realizes is that the brutal rapist and murderer has moved on to Southern California, and he's amping up the violence.